Uh, good afternoon and good morning for people who are joining us from US and Canada. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tony Eid. For the one who didn't know me or who don't know me, I'm the founder of Telecom Review and CEO of Trace Media. Welcome to today's webinar entitled Capacity and Data Traffic Enabling a Seamless Experience. We'll discuss today with our distinguished speakers the following topics. Managing the huge amount of data generated during COVID-19 pandemic. Role of the cloud in ensuring a seamless remote experience. The challenges that COVID-19 brought about to the wholesale industry. The challenge of maintaining network during lockdown and opportunity for satellite operators. Impact of the pandemic on the voice. Now I'm very glad to announce our special speakers for today. Mark Finger, CEO of PCW Global. Ali Amiri, Group Chief Carrier and Wholesale Officer at Salat. Frederick Chapin, CEO MTN Global Connect. Emmanuel Rocha, CEO International Carriers Orange. Sengis Ostelkan, CEO GBI. Vanit Meta, AVP, Region Head, MECAA Tata Communication. Riaz Zakak, Executive Vice President, Global Sales SES. We will have at the end poll question to the participant to open at least 15 minutes before the end of the session. And the Q&A will be at the completion of the webinar. So please make sure to stay with us and use the Q&A option button to send your question. Now we will start with our first question. Uh, how COVID, did COVID-19 affect the wholesale and capacity industry? And how did the wholesale industry help manage data traffic increases? Emmanuel, if you can take these questions now before we go to other speakers. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Well, obviously, this uh, this crisis has been uh, has been dramatic in terms of human impact, and uh, we can ha only have a thought for the for all the the victims of the of the pandemic. Uh, and it also has uh, um, a massive uh, impact on our. A wholesale international wholesale business. Uh, what we have experienced is uh, a very strong shift in terms of uh, of usage uh, in all our uh, businesses, and uh, and this has not been homogeneous. Some of our networks have been emptied, some of some of others have been overflowed. Uh, for example, you know, on voice, on the voice business, we've seen a very strong increase in terms of uh, domestic voice, uh, while the uh, the international voice suffered from the from the stop of the of the roaming. Uh, on data, we have all the enterprise networks uh, stopped, uh, uh, almost stopped working, but uh, at the same time, uh, we had a very strong increase in the public uh, uh, networks, the public internet, due to the, uh, the strong increase of uh, entertainment and uh, video conferencing. So uh, this, this has been a very, very uh, uh, shaken period. Um, and what we, have, uh, uh, what we have done as, uh, as the players of this industry, and I think we have done it uh, Quite well is to manage this and to uh, to be able to find a new route for the voice uh, to avoid the the domestic uh, uh, the domestic interconnections. Uh, we have had to uh, to uh, uh, to manage the balance of the traffic between the public internet and uh, and enterprise networks. Uh, and this we have we have had to do to do it in the in the pandemic situation where the, the our people were were uh, hardly uh, being able to. Uh, to go on the field, on the sites, in the premises, and, uh, and protecting the, the safety of all, uh, of all our employees. But that was very, very, um, very, very uh, uh, a strong period and uh, with a lot of challenges. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Mark, do you want to elaborate about uh, what happened with PCW during this period also? Well, uh, I think you know that PCW Global operates a, a global network and we uh, function as a the International Operating Division of HKT, which is the domestic uh, ICT, telco, call it, service provider in Hong Kong. And as you know, the virus uh, started early on in, in China and uh, reached Hong Kong, Taiwan, et cetera, very early. And we've seen the movement go from country to country. I'd say that Q1, February, March, significant impact in terms of traffic flows uh, as Emmanuel said, certainly for roaming and for other activities out of Hong Kong. Uh, interesting though, Q2, even though a lot of travel restrictions, we've seen an uptick in value from, uh, from Q1. Uh, although that's again now in the month of July, starting to uh, 
be impacted by what's referred to in Hong Kong as the third wave. Uh, we see that basically as you follow the COVID-19 story around the world, so too does traffic get impacted. Data traffic on the wholesale side and enterprise side, cloud accessibility, automation through our fabric over the first six months has seen a dramatic rise. IDD voice traffic, unusually for the first time in a long time has seen an uptick in the first six months, both in terms of value and in terms of uh, volume, uh, roaming significant decline. Uh, and interestingly, internally, we've saved quite a bit that has gone to our bottom line because we haven't traveled, we haven't gone to any events, we haven't been marketing as aggressively as we have before. We've been dealing mostly with operational activity. And so I think that in, in general, uh, the virus has made it challenging to forecast, uh, challenging for us to deal with uh, certain areas where it's difficult to get to, whether it be hospitals or other field locations. At the same time, we've seen colleagues working for PCCIV Global around the world, whenever they're providing necessary foundational infrastructure that they're willing to do just about anything in order to help governments, even at the local level, as well as hospitals and other types of uh, uh, essential facilities to function. And for that, I do want to say to all colleagues from the ICT industry who have been involved in assuring that we can all communicate uh, to offer our, our hats off and salute to everyone in the industry who really quietly has been helping uh, the world continue to function on an automated basis despite many stay at home issues. And I think that we functioned reasonably well considering everything. Thank you, Mark. Uh, now uh, we'll go to Ali Amiri. It is a lot operate in many countries. Let's start by what happened in UAE, for example. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, hi to all. <clears throat> I think uh, your question, uh, Tony, is that how did we manage maybe? But I think to manage something, you have to have a good uh, background. You have to have good facilities. So uh, I believe uh, I mean, in terms of uh, readiness, thank God we had the uh, right infrastructure in place. Maybe that's, we have to say it. We could only see that we have the right infrastructure in place once we experience that. Because as you know, I mean, we had to really come up with a lot of capacities and that, not only that, we found also some customers are not, have not asked for uh, sort of uh, services to be all drowned on their uh, devices, internet and all. So we, we used everything which was in place, in fact. When it comes to international connectivity, I think we were ready. So we brought up something like over 1.23 tera of capacity that was in shorter time than 10 days. And that was a big uh, challenge, of course. Not only that, we used, uh, of course, 4G. I mean, UE being also 4G, not only even domestically, but also internationally for roaming. We been, I think that helped a lot of areas where we had to provide that in terms of fixed services as well. So uh, I think uh, in addition to the fiber to the home, I think again, I'm not saying this is part of propaganda or whatever, but we have been number one in terms of fiber to the home since some time. So we could manage basing on what we had and that the only thing we have to thank our partners abroad in terms of international connectivity, uh, that they helped us a lot during all these lockdowns, all these uh, health issues faced by who could, they could send technicians right and left in order to help uh, us and the rest of the partners. So I think that was really a good thing that we, we did uh, as a result of all the readiness. I mean, if you think of it in terms of uh, uh, wholesale, uh, definitely when we had our smart hub or all these international countries that we had in place, that made us to at least uh, come up uh, fast and, and, and with all the pressures that we had from left to right, whether from the government or from, the, from even our uh, consumer business, 
I think we made almost everyone happy and that's, uh, we have to thank God for it. But uh, at the same time, I think everyone together with our partners, we have to thank everyone who worked with us. I think that was a good achievement. So we are happy of what we did. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, someone has the phone is ringing. What's up? Please mute your phone uh, close to this thing. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Frederick, uh, MTN also operate in many other countries. So if you can uh, also tell us what's happened during the pandemic with you. Yeah, th thanks, Tony, for, for making this, this event happen also. I think it's, it's a good way in, uh, in, in sharing experience and, and certainly gather people again uh, together, I think. And, and, and I salute you for, uh, for organizing that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, now, from, a, from an MTN perspective, I mean, we're, we're kind of the new kids on the block with MTN Global Connect, where we, we manage the, uh, the international business uh, and all the connectivity for, uh, for the MTN uh, group, uh, which, which carries over 250, 260 million subscribers business, mainly in Africa and, and, a, and a bit in the Middle East. Uh, it was kind of a, a, a hard start and a challenging start uh, of this year because uh, before COVID-19 even, although it was already happening a little bit uh, in, in, in China, like Mark was, uh, was saying, and in Hong Kong, uh, uh, we, we also had a, a, a massive, uh, let's say, cable cuts. I think seven cables got cut uh, 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 on the same day, beginning of the year. So it, it, it kind of already put, put us uh, on our toes uh, around Africa. Uh, where we saw Ace uh, 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 got cut uh, twice, uh, uh, the wax cable also got uh, got down, uh, various other uh, sat tree, etc. got got down. So I mean, we, we were already beginning of the year, all hands on deck, in order to make sure that uh, everything was well uh, restored, uh, the business was running properly, uh, and we added quite a, an astonishing amount, and the team did fantastic in booting up additional capacity already. So when COVID-19 really starting to hit uh, our operations, uh, we were already uh, at, at the higher strength uh, with more backups, with even more uh, strengthened networks uh, all over the place, which we actually never decommissioned uh, from the start also in order to cater to the, uh, on the tremendous growth uh, we saw from a um, from connectivity or capacity perspective, mainly on data. What did happen is we, we saw uh, in certain markets around 30 to 35 percent growth, uh, sometimes month on month in terms of data uptake. Uh, the voice also grew um, quite quite substantially uh, where, where people were really uh, messaging and, and calling each other to make sure that uh, everything is okay or, or um, is going well. And the only thing which really fell literally off a cliff uh, was the entire roaming fabric uh, within uh, within uh, Global Connector. We, we centralized most of the activities already through our, our, our um, verticalized uh, platforms. And there we saw really, if you saw every country shutting down their borders, you saw literally also uh, almost all the roaming activities stopping. Uh, and, and this is still, still extremely severely perturbed. Uh, I think we see today a stabilization of, of most of the data and, and the voice traffic. Uh, but from a roaming perspective, we still have um, uh, uh, a, a, a drop, which is uh, almost at two zero. Oh, thank you, Frederick. And regarding the cable cut, we'll go back to, to other speakers for this. Uh, thank you. Uh, Vanit, uh, if you can connect about this, please, uh, now. Yeah, thanks, Tony, uh, for organizing this knowledge sharing panel. Uh, really glad to be a part of this. Uh, as Tata Communications, uh, uh, we operate in the uh, wholesale space, as you know, and we primarily have three verticals and all three had different levels of positive and I would say negative impacts as well. So on a wholesale side, I, I agree with all my uh, colleagues that, you know, uh, we had a growth in data. So whether that data is coming from a Netflix getting browsed at home on a you know higher rate than before or or uh, a work from home being enforced and all that stuff or even and even within the wholesale space uh, it was primarily the OTTs were driving the data consumption up or more. Uh, the second segment which we focus on as Tata Communications is the enterprise space where we definitely saw uh, decision making getting delayed. So there were some large projects which got delayed for several reasons and uh, 
the decision making wasn't happening so that gave us some amount of it but it was more than compensated in the wholesale space uh, voice pretty much since we don't operate in the uh, retail voice uh, it, it we saw some marginal growth on the voice side so uh, i think net net uh, uh, these unprecedented uh, times, um, nobody had forecasted these in their business case uh, or in their balance sheets ever. Uh, everyone was taken by surprise, but uh, it, it resulted, at least for the wholesale industry, it uh, 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 resulted in a, a lot of upside. Uh, whereas, you know, the, uh, when you go to aviation, for example, Emirates, uh, who is one of our biggest customers, they were bleeding, suffering, and, you know, we had to... Uh, uh, so we live with them and give them concessions, which was definitely a hit on our bottom line as well. So I think overall, uh, the, the businesses uh, did grow, uh, but there was some decline in the bottom line as well because of all the COVID concessions, which we had to give towards the empathetic uh, sectors of the industry as uh, data communications. Uh, thank you, Vanit. Uh, if anyone would the comment on this also, if not, we go to, to the other questions. Tony, uh, let me just take one, one second, please. Yeah, uh, please. Just want to uh, touch on the point that uh, uh, there's always two sides of the coin here, right? I mean, uh, as many of the uh, distinguished speakers indicated, there is, uh, there's been a surge in the demand, uh, especially on the services, capacity services, IP transit services and whatnot. What we've seen is, uh, is that it's the similar trend. Uh, we experienced that too. But the surge was in, in bare essentials, right? Uh, the operators just needed to meet that demand. But on the other hand, uh, they started uh, shortly after the pandemic, they started cutting down the budgets, right? So any project that was not pure necessity, absolute need, uh, it either got uh, canceled or uh, postponed. So We've seen both sides of the story here, right? Some uh, increased demand on uh, on uh, basic services, but anything exciting that uh, maybe you've been working on uh, ended up getting postponed due to the fact that organizationals uh, reacted uh, severely uh, to this pandemic, and everybody started uh, cutting down on uh, investments and and spending, and anything that was not uh, absolute top urgency. Uh, got pushed out. So uh, again, that was the negative side of the coin that uh, that we have experienced. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, Elias, you want to comment on this? Yeah, yeah Tony, I just want to, uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to attend this panel. It's my pleasure. Um, SES um, is, uh, as you know, the largest satellite operator. And um, we uh, our mission is really to provide global connectivity uh, solutions largely dependent on satellites. Uh, we have three verticals within SES networks, the data side of the business. One is mobility, the other one is government, the third one is what we call fixed data. Fixed data being uh, all of our IP transit uh, connectivity solutions, our cellular backhaul solutions, our VSAT networks, etc. Uh, I'll, I'll take those three verticals one by one. In, um, in mobility, uh, we did uh, see quite a, uh, a, a heavy impact because of COVID. Mobility is our solutions to uh, airlines, uh, aero, and our solutions, uh, uh, connectivity solutions to cruise. And as you know, both the airline uh, traffic and the cruise traffic is uh, down substantially. So that part of our business uh, is, is uh, under pressure. Uh, in cruise, we're down to uh, basically supporting cruise, uh, the cruise on the cruise ships uh, as they stay on the ship and the ship is going around trying to find a port that will accept it, basically. Uh, that's kind of like where we are right now. Uh, so the mobility is under pressure. Our government networks are holding steady. Uh, so we're, uh, we're okay there. Uh, our fixed data business, which is the seller backhaul, IP transit, and VSAT networks, is actually um, uh, doing very well in terms of uh, the demand and our ability to support them. Um, we look at uh, the pandemic as having caused a shift in where the demand is. Um, if you think of pre-COVID, 
there was a he heavy demand in the urban areas, in the cities that are extremely well connected with people working from home. What we saw is a shift away from the cities, from the urban areas to the suburban areas and the rural areas that are more dependent on satellite connectivity uh, than the urban areas. So we've had to actually uh, provide more connectivity services out uh, in the uh, less well-connected areas around the world. And uh, what we saw is a huge increase in demand for satellite services direct to home. So uh, people that have small dishes, uh, 65, 75 centimeter dishes receiving uh, 25, 50 meg, uh, they, they were upgrading their services. What we saw also is uh, a lot of demand to support cellular uh, networks that are further out in the rural areas. And we provided uh, additional uh, uh, capacity and throughput to those areas. Uh, we call this out to aggregation points, whether it's to a cellular uh, tower or whether it's to a Wi-Fi hotspot, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the uh, geographies, we saw a huge increase uh, both in Africa and in Asia. A lot of it is driven uh, by, uh, again, uh, more demand, as all the panelists have said. There were some fiber cuts. Uh, uh, we talked about the one in Africa. There was recently one in PNG. Um, and there was a lot of demand for e-health networks to areas that were not well connected. So we were providing a lot of uh, health connectivity services um, in those areas as well. Um, some of the challenges that we've had is uh, where we had an existing satellite site, it was easy to just upgrade. You know, we had software-defined networks uh, and we're just able to upgrade them relatively easy. Some sites were in locations where we could not send a technician to. Uh, and Ali talked about some of those uh, challenges. Uh, uh, if, if we cannot get into DRC, for example, or CAR uh, to uh, send a technician to install a new site, uh, it took us some time to do that. It wasn't easy. So, so these are the uh, pluses and negatives that uh, SES experienced because of the pandemic. Okay, thank you, Elias. Now we will go to, in fact, the same question was already answered uh, indirectly by Emmanuel and Mark, but I will go to Mark again. Uh, with Patrick, as I said before, uh, that voice increased by 35%. This is it's based, in fact, on uh, in US and Verizon report. What's the pandemic impact on voice in your region? Okay, and do you think we'll continue the trend after the COVID-19? Mark, it's yours, please. Uh, I think that uh, the rise in voice traffic uh, that we've seen in the first half of 2020 as compared to the same period last year is as a result of uh, much less travel and, uh, and people wanting to stay in touch and making sure at the consumer level that families and loved ones are okay. Uh, we see that the traffic is continuing to rise inbound and outbound in Africa as we speak. I think that uh, in Asia Pacific, certainly the northern part of Asia, traffic has somewhat uh, settled. Uh, we are seeing more traffic flows from Southern Hemisphere also in Latin America. So I, I think that, that to some extent there is a corollary between the spread of the pandemic and the rise of traffic generated often by people's concern and perhaps just generally everyone dealing collectively with the uncertainty of the situation. And so when you ask me, will it continue afterwards? It's like uh, asking me to be a prophet and to forecast. And I can tell you the one thing that I'm certain of as a result of COVID-19 is that I have no certainty of anything. Uh, I think that this situation has made forecasting an art form. And the, the better that we can do uh, to plan for the future and to plan for the unknown is simply to try and consider as many possibilities as may exist and to see what may evolve. We don't know, one, when this issue will be resolved, two, how governments will deal with it in whatever form of resolution it takes, whether vaccine or otherwise, and even a vaccine, governments may choose to deal with it asymmetrically. There's no guarantee that everything will be done in the same way. And so, 
Unfortunately, I can't give you a firm answer to what will be. I can only tell you, let's plan for the worst and hope for the best and see if we're able to uh, recover and build our business back into a forecastable environment in 2021, 2022. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, if anyone would like to comment to this, maybe Mark uh, said something very good. Prepare for the worst and uh, hopeful for the best. Okay, so Frederick, you want to comment on this? You know, that's exactly what we've done also at MTN. I mean, uh, we, we, we've, we've, we've strengthened um, uh, not only uh, the, the interaction with our customers uh, globally, internationally, um, with our internal customers also. Um, you, 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 you make sure that um, all parameters from a equation of uh, potential uh, worsening is being considered. Um, you try to invest wisely in the points which are badly needed in order to make sure um, a second or a third wave uh, could be uh, catched up. From a management perspective also, um, a lot of us, uh, most of the uh, executive committee, including most of the CEOs and their executive committees, have given in uh, quite a substantial amount uh, to funds uh, in order to support not only our employees, uh, but also uh, tactically also uh, the uh, local markets uh, where we do see that the most needed uh, needs to be supported in one way or another, uh, giving also uh, incentives of, of, of zero rating uh, a lot of the national as well as some international transactions. Uh, if you're talking about uh, mobile money uh, or, or data uh, for schools, all of that has been very proactively been immediately activated uh, uh, through a very dedicated team who was coordinating that and which was also headed by, um, by our group uh, chief operating uh, officer across all markets. Uh, what is also very, very uh, interesting is that, I mean, there's a new way of working also which we embrace, which wasn't really very common, especially in, in certain of our markets. Uh, in Africa, including here in the UAE, we still have a, a kind of work from home till till the 1st of September. Uh, although, I mean, today uh, it's actually the first afternoon. I just came to the office uh, to do this, uh, to do this conf call uh, in, in a more quiet uh, way because there's actually literally one or two people uh, at the office where usually we have over 150 people here in, in, in Dubai just. So it's, it's, it's quite a, a dramatic uh, shift and, and change. Uh, on the right side, I mean, yes, I mean, we're all heavy travelers, I think, uh, as, as a C-suite here around the table. Uh, so uh, it gives sometimes also um, uh, a good way to, to spend more quality time uh, with, with the family. And, and that's, I think, really something which uh, we need to embrace also. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, Ali, you want to add something about some statistic of the voice and what do you think the trend will be after the COVID-19? Hopefully it will end soon. Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, voice will not end the, after you mean COVID-19 will end soon, hopefully. Yes. But um, voice during, uh, definitely during the, this pandemic, I think uh, impacted, uh, it was almost, it went back, some impact and reduction was because of no roaming. Because, you know, and especially places like uh, UAE, I mean, we have a lot of roamers from everywhere. And those voices, which was uh, exchanged between the roamers and, uh, and their home countries disappeared. In addition, of course, during the time that there was less mobility and people are not moving and offices also not uh, working uh, at full scale. So that also impacted in terms of uh, voice reduction. Now, if your question is that, what will happen to the voice Going forward, is that the question? Uh, yes. So, I mean, if we regularize after the, 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 the pandemic, uh, I think uh, we will, those uh, voices, uh, I, I think that definitely think the moment that 
there's good news about real good vaccine. There's good news about disappearance of the thing. People go back to their old habit. This is, a, I have a feeling. So voices we lost as a result of roaming, I personally feel it will come back. If not all, most of it because people got used to using social media, whether on mobile, on fix and all that. And areas that you don't have full social media open, maybe that percentage still not come back. So there's a new way of working and people got used to new things. But again, people also forget, they go back to the old thing maybe. So it is definitely not going to go back to 100% what it was, the real reduction, but we hope that there will be a recovery. It will be recovered to a good extent. Thank you. Thank you. My now quick question to you, Sanjis. Did you see increase in traffic first half of 2020 in your infrastructure cable or no? We sure did, uh, Tony. And uh, specifically in our region, it was a uh, double whammy. I mean, uh, immediately after the pandemic hit and uh, the lockdowns uh, started, then came the Ramadan time, right? Which is uh, historically uh, another uh, spike uh, in uh, in traffic, yeah, traditionally in the, in the Ramadan observing countries, right? Because that's the time where people uh, tend to stay uh, at home and really increase their, uh, uh, especially on the retail side, right? Uh, usage of the internet. So we have seen a bit of a double uh, double whammy during the first uh, half of 2020 uh, on on our uh, on our traffic on our system, right? And uh, but on the other hand. Another thing that I quickly would like to touch here is that, I mean, for uh, many years, we've been talking about digitalization and uh, going into digital governments and, and whatnot, right? So uh, as an operator of a submarine cable system, which, uh, you know, are prone to cuts and, uh, and elaborate uh, permitting processes, we uh, also learned in this period that uh, most governments are not really uh, nowhere near being digital, right? especially uh, during the lockdowns when the government offices were shut down. Uh, we suffered a great deal of uh, loss of time uh, for simple permitting processes, for instance, to, to repair cuts, right? So again, it exposed uh, an area that uh, most everyone thought that uh, many countries were going down this digitalization path that uh, some of uh, even the most uh, basic processes uh, are not even there. So. Uh, Again, uh, we always look for uh, some uh, improvement opportunities in uh, even the worst case uh, cases that uh, that we face, right? And I think this is a lesson to be to be learned that uh, such pandemics, such situations, really expose uh, uh, our processes in in many different uh, <coughs> sectors, in our businesses, in governments, and whatnot. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, now uh, I will go to the third question: What are the challenges that the pandemic has brought about the wholesale industry? especially in terms of data transport and customer service. And how did you manage to adapt with this situation and these challenges? Uh, Emmanuel, it's yours, please. Yes, thank you, Tony. Um, well, I see, say, four, four challenges mainly we had to face during this, uh, this period. The first one is, uh, is the network challenge, the capacity challenge that we already uh, discussed that in the, in the previous uh, uh, section. Um, the second one is, uh, is really about the customer relation because we are in an industry where we are used to meet people, to meet our customers, our partners, our providers uh, in large uh, meetings, uh, conferences. Uh, and we had to, uh, from one day to the other, to adapt to uh, a new situation where we have to uh, discuss to, uh, with our customers over the phone, over the video calls. Um, and this is a very uh, uh, different way as we are used to. Um, we have also to, uh, we have had to adapt in terms of our marketing to how we address our customers, how we talk to the market without having uh, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these large events that we are used to. Uh, so this is a, a major challenge and this is going to, uh, to last and, and has triggered a number of, uh, of projects within, uh, within our range to, uh, to adapt to this, uh, to this new situation. The third challenge I see is around security. So we have seen um, an explosion of uh, attacks, an explosion of fraud, an, an explosion of uh, spamming 
during this period of time. I've seen a, f a figure with a, a multiplication by seven of the uh, of the phishing attacks during the during the period. Uh, we have seen also a, 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 an increase of 40% of our fraud alerts, uh, and the spamming has also uh, uh, increased quite a lot. So this is a uh, this is very important, and we see that our customers are really concerned about that. And uh, and uh, our, our role is to, is really to uh, to uh, increase uh, our tools to uh, to fight against these. Uh, threats and help our customers protect themselves against those, uh, those threats. Um, and finally, uh, and of course, we, we already mentioned it, but the, the human challenge is really uh, uh, major during this period. And, uh, and, and this is going to, to last. I've seen a question on the, on the chat with, uh, about what it's going to be the, the, the working from home practices after the COVID crisis. So this is a real question because uh, from one day to the other in a, uh, Within Orange IC, we have uh, moved everybody from uh, working on the in the office to working from home, and we have we have seen that this is uh, this has been working. Uh, this has been working uh, maybe because we were in a crisis and that everybody was mobilized around uh, solving the crisis. So the question is, in the long run, uh, and independently of the sanitary uh, situation, what uh, is going to be the the new way of working together? Uh, within an organization with uh, a number of people uh, willing and aspiring to be uh, more uh, more king, working from home than uh, than today so this is a uh, this is a real challenge in terms of uh, cooperation and uh, and and leading our, our projects and our thank transformations you, thank you Marianne. Uh, Lias, uh at the satellite network what are the challenges uh, can you explain about these challenges you're facing and you had adapt have you solved so, so, so what we're seeing actually, rather than challenges, is opportunities. I don't want to be insensitive to all the pain that the pandemic has caused a lot of people, but I want to talk about the opportunities that the pandemic has opened our eyes to. Number one is digitization. Uh, what we're seeing now is a lot of countries are moving much faster to digitization, realizing that this is an important part of their roadmap. And, and that's driving uh, all of us to do a much bigger job to support digitization of economies around the world. Uh, the second thing that we noticed at SES is that a lot of our networks that we've invested heavily in, uh, sorry, but the light went off. Uh, a lot of our networks that we invested heavily on uh, in terms of software defined networks and uh, cloud support uh, we can support them from home. Uh, so uh, our network control, uh, network operation control people, not people, uh, using all the uh, access we have to cloud and direct connectivity, we're able to maintain our same level of service, if not better, uh, with most of them not having to go to an operation center. And our, we were able to support our customers remotely uh, using cloud access. And thirdly, what we have realized, and I think a lot of people real, realized, is how essential satellites are to the global um, uh, infrastructure. Um, as you know, SES provides geo and meo. We're the only one that is uh, NGSO and geo. And uh, for those uh, partners of ours, that have software-defined networks that can uh, reroute traffic, whether it's via satellite, via fiber, via geo, via MEO, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, they, they were able to deal with the pandemic a lot better than those that don't have that uh, capability, uh, software-defined capabilities. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we were able to take care of the telecom requirements of entire countries like PRC and PNG during the pandemic. So, so what I'm seeing here is, a lot, uh, the challenge is really for us to build out our capabilities to support these new uh, requirements that we see coming out of the pandemic. Uh, thank you, Elias. Uh, now we'll go to another question. Uh, how important was the cloud adoption under the pandemic? Uh, I will go to question to Vanit, please. Yeah, so uh, I think Elias uh, partially answered that. So the digital adoption, uh, Tony, uh, uh, has expedited after the pandemic. Uh, uh, so whoever was uh, 
you know, doing it at a slow pace as an enterprise or as a service provider. So the digital adoption or the digitalization of services which uh, the, the customers offer to their end consumers has really gone up and uh, which, which has led to uh, uh, an increased cloud adoption. Even, even uh, working in a regulated environment like Middle East, Central Asia and Africa, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, cloud adoption which has been uh, taken up by, you know, especially with the, the contact center uh, companies. Uh, who are looking at more and more of a cloud solution because now most of their call center agents, as an example, are sitting at home. So they want to offer them, uh, they still want to offer a, a omni-channel experience to their uh, consumers, but their agents are sitting at home. So they are fast tracking it. Uh, uh, comes with this is the challenge of uh, security uh, because he's using his own infrastructure at home. It, it's a, a DSL line and uh, how, how does this all happen in a secure manner. So cloud adoption packaged with security, Emmanuel rightly mentioned uh, uh, the, the attacks went up during a COVID, phishing attacks, DDoS attacks, etc. We've recently seen even one of the large OTTs uh, getting attacked. Uh, uh, but at the same time, at the start of my conversation, I mentioned that you know uh, the OTTs were the biggest uh, consumers of bandwidth during this uh, pandemic. Uh, which again links back to uh, the same question that if, if these are the guys who are uh, uh, increasing the data usage and obviously, you know, uh, the Amazons of the world are also helping uh, in the cloud adoption journey of any of the enterprises. So all that has worked in tandem and uh, uh, in a nutshell or as a conclusion, I would say definitely, yes, the cloud adoption has increased. Uh, in the region and I would say globally as well. So regula especially regulated countries like where we operate, this has really gone up a lot. Thank you, Daniel. Mark, uh, PCW in your network, did you see increase in the cloud? Especially you have last year, uh, you, you update your uh, data center, I guess, uh, in a very nice way when I visited. Uh, thanks, so I think, you know, f further to what uh, both Elias and Vanit were saying, the uh, cloud in and of itself has become uh, a primary infrastructure for users. You have cloud as an infrastructure, various forms of network are an infrastructure, whether it's satellite, terrestrial fiber, subsea fiber, towers, etc. And data centers are an infrastructure. And those three infrastructures, each of them function well within their own ecosystem, but they require some sort of automated capability uh, in order to interconnect those various infrastructures and make them meaningful and usable with QoS for, uh, for applications and enterprises. And that's one of the reasons why we invested in Comsol Connect, which is our uh, software-defined interconnect fabric. It's a platform that allows a meeting place for all forms of infrastructure, data centers, clouds, networks, with variant forms of applications, uh, all to the benefit of a user community. Uh, it can be someone from our network or from a counterparty network using the console connect platform in order to avail themselves. And what we've seen through that automated fabric in the last uh, 12 months, and certainly as a result of COVID-19, there's been an increasing demand for uh, access to cloud. Uh, what users are interested in is making sure that they can access that environment with QoS and with the commercial capability to do it on demand. They don't want to be paying for long-term contracts. They want to be paying for what they use, and we're doing our best through the fabric to accommodate that environment. And I think that COVID-19 has just accelerated that process. Because there's such a demand for automation and remote and work from home, uh, all of these activities have become really quite critical. And without automation, without automating the fabric that connects uh, various forms of infrastructure with all sites of applications, that enterprises or others may require, uh, we're in a challenge, certainly in this remote working environment that has evolved globally. So I, it's become a no-brainer. Everyone wants to leverage the value that cloud brings. They also want to assure that cloud can be delivered with assured QoS from the network, and they want to do that in the zones of availability associated with the data centers that are there. And if they're able to do that on demand, automate it, then there's always going to be an increased demand. And I think that COVID-19, if nothing else, and the markets of late have also demonstrated to us that anything that's driving new age automation 
of usability of service is something which is necessary and attractive. And certainly the investors are liking it lately. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Frederick, do you want to add something about this cloud uh, use during the pandemic? No, I, I completely second also what, what uh, Mark is saying. I mean, automation is, is something certainly which will uh, which is barely needed and, and, and where we um, as, as MT and Global Connect are fast tracking a lot of our digitization programs also uh, uh, through, through cloud enablement uh, across, across our markets uh, for our customers uh, and mainly also for internal uh, use uh, to make it easier where you, you have less and less physical, let's say, uh, proprietary setups in place which 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 uh, could actually uh, hamper uh, our, our growth also i mean uh, you have to understand that uh, the african continent is, is still growing uh, dramatically not only from a demographic perspective but also from an economical perspective also and and, and i think also for for the the wider good uh, in, in in the belief we have as mtn uh, to make sure that everybody deserves a digital uh, enabled uh, environment. And I think we, we continue that quest also to, uh, to, uh, to grow it uh, through um, a, a cloud enabled environment, uh, partially, uh, but also uh, continuing and in investing in, in massively in the infrastructure uh, where uh, as, as an infraco business, we also are laying a tremendous amount of, of, of fiber uh, on the continent in order to cater uh, for all of that uh, cloud capacity need because at the end uh, all the cloud ends up onto a fiber somewhere if it's on the wet segment or on the dry segment and, and I think uh, we cannot invest enough in order to grow that also further especially in Africa. Thank you Frederick. Uh, uh, Ali you want to add something about the cloud? Well <clears throat> I think uh, let me speak maybe this pandemic uh, brought up to the focus the use of cloud. And people may say, especially some small operators maybe may say, thanks to Cloudify. Because, I mean, most of these uh, collaboration platforms, the storage is used, files access, and all that was, has been through cloud. And I think organizations or those who have really been well established before uh, I think they had less concern in terms of security, less concerns in terms of working from remote, remotely access. That is why at the beginning when I said that readiness and how people managed is mainly because we were ready in terms of cloud. That was the case at least with the Salat and most of its, of course, worldwide. You know, we're in 16 countries, wherever we are. At least that has been as part of the vision that you have to be cloud equipped. And that showed during this pandemic that in no time, at least everyone could access anywhere, anytime, and from any device. And that was really quite important. So cloud was sort of uh, more uh, recognized or uh, this due to this pandemic. And I think going forward, uh, whether it's a consumer or business or wholesalers, they all have to, I agree with whatever that uh, Mark uh, was saying, and then this XAS, everything as a, as a service uh, platform, such things will have to come more and more. And that's, by the way, will be readiness for future, now and the future. So you have now created uh, a sort of a trend where you have to, you cannot do it without it. So uh, I think that's how the role of the cloud. Thank you, Ali. Uh, Sanjeev, do you want to elaborate about the cloud, the need and the increase of the cloud during the pandemic? Yeah, sure, uh, Tony. I, I think uh, one point again, I'd like to add on to uh, all the remarks that the other uh, speakers made was that up until the pandemic, I think most uh, opponents of the cloud uh, we're putting forward uh, uh, the security reasons for lack of cloud adoption, right? I think the necessity that uh, was created to use cloud services during the pandemic 
put the security concerns uh, somewhat in the back seat, right? And uh, and people just needed uh, immediate solutions. They needed to meet the demand in a in a way that was unprecedented, right? So they they were even the opponents of cloud. Uh, the last uh, frontier that were resisting, for instance, they were forced to use uh, uh, cloud uh, applications, cloud cloud based uh, applications, which I think uh, uh, you know showed them that cloud is there for real. And uh, but uh, on the other hand, I think people will soon come back to the security concerns, data sovereignty type uh, concerns, and. Uh, and there will be a balance between the, again, adaption of cloud and usage of cloud services in conjunction with the security aspects, right? But right now security is in the back burner. Uh, that's my assumption. People are just trying to get through this, uh, this tough time, right? Making use of the best available uh, uh, applications of cloud out there. But it will, uh, once uh, things uh, set, settle down a little bit, the security concerns will uh, emerge again. And, and as the, as the providers of cloud connectivity, it's a, it's a good time for us to really uh, think about this. And although, you know, as Mark said, we could not forecast the market, we could forecast what the market will demand uh, after, uh, after this uh, uh, few months of, uh, of really uh, struggling and trying to find our feet on the ground. Thank you, uh, Sanjeev. Now we'll go to one more questions. Uh... Uh, how do you predict the changes in the wholesale and capacity industry post pandemic? And what the lasting effect do you think with the manage? I will, I will go to you, Emmanuel now. Yes, thank you, Tony. Uh, well, I, my view is that uh, this crisis has triggered a number of, uh, of changes in our industry, in our society, uh, uh, almost everywhere, but with uh, some of them are, are, are quite positive and uh, probably the, our major challenge is to avoid to try to go back to the uh, to the old normal situation uh, and uh, and uh, leverage and accelerate the, those positive changes that has been uh, has been triggered and opportunities. Um, from uh, from Orange perspective, one uh, one of the learnings from this crisis is that we need to accelerate on network transformation in order to mutualize as much as possible our infrastructures and uh, and build the, our different services on this. Uh, uh, common infrastructure in order to have a, a very smooth and uh, and automated uh, networks that can uh, balance the the, the 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 capacity between one service and one other. If we have to face this is the same type of uh, major shift between uh, uh, some uh, application and others, um, these networks and uh, needs to be uh, I, I mentioned it more automated because we we need to be more prepared that we were. To, uh, uh, to, pro to produce new services, to provision new, uh, new, uh, new, new uh, circuits on a, on, on a, uh, uh, without having a human intervention on the field. Uh, and we have also to, uh, to have those, that network even more secure as, as, uh, than what, what, what they are today, uh, because the, the, we see that the challenges from the threats are, are increasing. Uh, another major transformation we, we have to uh, to, uh, to endorse is the digital transformation. Uh, I mentioned the, the transformation of our relation uh, with our customers, with our partners. Uh, this is a, a major one, and I think we are, our industry has uh, quite a lot to do yet in terms of uh, uh, moving to, the, to being more digital to, to our customers. And finally, uh, we have to transform our uh, management culture. Uh, we have to, uh, to adapt to uh, uh, new ways of uh, of working, we have to adapt to uh, working from uh, from home. These changes are now here, but we need to uh, to get prepared to have those changes installed for the for the for the next uh, for the future. And probably uh, this crisis will trigger a, a really uh, a new uh, a new world. Uh, and I think that we will be able to uh, to to tell uh, the story of this crisis to our grandchildren, uh, stating that this is the the, the starting point of a new uh, of a new story for. For, the, for, our, for our industry, of course, but for the, for the world as whole. Emmanuel, now I will base on your, uh, on your, what you said, in fact, to ask questions to Vanit. Vanit, ask Per Emmanuel, what you plan to which industry you will give more attention, okay, you, based on the experience during this pandemic? Uh, you're talking about a post-pandemic scenario or during the pandemic? 
to now, need. During the pandemic, we learned a lot of things, okay? So which after the pandemic, let's say post pandemic, as the pandemic is over, which industry would be on your focus or hit list? I think, uh, Tony, uh, uh, w one thing we'll, we'll have to all uh, accept, I would say, is uh, the po there, there would not be a, a post-pandemic scenario, uh, you know, in the near future at least, even though if there would be a vaccine, there would be different waves of this uh, uh, COVID in different countries. Different countries will try to open up in different ways. Every country will have its own regulation as to, you know, whether the aviation or the flights open up or they don't open up. So uh, having said that, I think uh, the uh, enterprises, especially in, in the aviation space, who have you know, kind of suffered a lot during this uh, pandemic situation and the, re and the hospitality segment, I would say. And even uh, as Tata Group, you know, uh, uh, Taj, we have our hospitality uh, a segment, which is uh, suffering a lot during this time. So is our aviation segment as well. So these would be the focus for I think all of us uh, to be brought back. And again, th these would be brought back in, you know, how do you optimize their cost? How do you make their cloud adoption or digitalization expedited and make them run in an agile and, uh, you know, in a, in a very cost effective manner. So these two industries, and I would say if we are operating in this part of the world, even the oil and gas would be uh, a, uh, a sector to watch out uh, once the, uh, uh, oil prices start to go up because those those would be again uh, industries which will be uh, looking at more investments uh, uh, going forward thank you mark what did you say which uh, which which industry will take more of your uh, focus uh, of pandemic after the pandemic i think that um, not so much a specific vertical because one thing that we learned if you spend too much time with one vertical for example aviation or leisure, uh, you can get burned, <laughs> as we've learned in the uh, pandemic environment. And it's necessary, therefore, not to have all your eggs in one basket. And, uh, and so I think it's more important that we focus on the trends that we were talking about for ourselves, which was increased digitalization and automation. And I think that wherever we can find any industry enabler that's helping a, an environment convert itself, transform itself to a more automated digital environment. That's the place that we as ICT service providers should be helping to facilitate. And not only that, we should also be learning from them. And, uh, and the only thing that I would comment about post-pandemic, pre-pandemic, I'm with Vinit uh, completely. I'm not certain that there's a hard line around that. And I think, you know, everyone uses the words new normal and I've yet to figure out what, what's normal and what's new. I will tell you that we're living through a constant state of change, a constant state of uncertainty, and that will require all of us to be very creative, very flexible and adapt to the situation. I think that's what you're looking for in the question, Tony, from us is what's necessary from us the next step. And I say, uh, complete flexibility to acclimate to user needs as they evolve, focusing on what this new evolving environment is going to require. Uh, I wish I could agree with Mr. Amiri and say, we're gonna pop back to the way things were. Uh, I'm hopeful that will happen, but I'm not convinced it will. And so I think we have to ready ourselves for both. If you'll allow me just one other thing, this industry, the wholesale industry that you started the question with, a lot of the work that we've done over many years has to deal with our personal relationships that we've evolved over many events, many gatherings, informal and so on. And I hope that we'll continue to meet at least virtually the way you facilitated, Tony, so that we can assure that our businesses continue to function while we also learn how to automate them. What we've done over the years in facilitating the industry through our informal relationships is quite critical. And I think we ought to be cautious that in the new post pandemic world, as you call it, that we not lose sight of that. And that we make sure that we continue to deliver personal interoperability relationships amongst the ICT community so that the users across the globe can benefit from those combined values. Thank you, Mark, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> very insightful. Elias, do you want to uh, elaborate on this or no? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Uh, Tony, I think uh, asking which industry we want to focus on 
is akin to asking which one of your children is your favorite child. Uh, we love them all equally. Uh, we, we want to do the best for all of industries. That's a marketing it's, answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whether it's uh, supporting our uh, customers who are airlines or cruise ships or uh, telcos or uh, governments, uh, we love them all equally. I think uh, the, the, the answer really is what are those enablers that cut across all of these industries, all of these verticals that we need to focus on? And the answer uh, for SES is two things. One is uh, faster automation of our networks, and most importantly, uh, ad adoption of cloud. SDS itself has embraced cloud. Pretty much all of our BI systems are already in the cloud. Uh, but what we want to make sure of is that we can enable all of our customers to, uh, to do the same. And so if you look at what we're doing, for example, with O3B Empower, this is our multi-billion dollar investment we're less than a year away from launching. This is our second gen NGSO when others are still not on gen one. Um, this is gonna be huge throughput. We're talking terabits worth of uh, capacity. We're talking dynamic allocation of throughput, uh, uh, anywhere, anytime type allocation of capacity. And we're talking low latency. But most importantly is how do we make that uh, cloud friendly for our customers. So what we're doing now is we are working with the, all the cloud providers to build our gateways, not somewhere where an application has to be from a customer side to our gateway, our gateway to a cloud. We're building our gateways right at the cloud uh, data centers where the application goes straight into the cloud, it's secure, uh, so we, we make that uh, available and in reverse, we're extending the cloud to the edge to allow more edge computing and faster uh, responses. So that's what we're focused on right now, automation and cloud adoption. Okay, thank you, Elias. Uh, now, uh, Frederick, can you answer me, but not very diplomatic like Elias, okay? <laughs> 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 well, there, there are three three things I think which certainly needs to be be happening. First of all, it's 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 the overall new way of, in an agile way, managing the change, and this is this is from a a an employer perspective, an employee perspective, as well as from a customer perspective, which, which will completely and is completely changing the way I think we, we are doing business or we are interacting. So I think agility is something which is, which is badly need, needed in, in these, these, um, these times. Uh, on top of that, I think as an industry, we, we can do a lot of, of good in order to make sure that we support as an essential service or an essential business to support all these changes in the industry um, uh, with, with a good, robust um, setup of infrastructure uh, uh, base, but also make sure that we, we facilitate through a digitization process um, the, the enablement of all of that. So I think these are the three key uh, I think things which we certainly would like to uh, to drive and, and to achieve because I'm, I'm afraid this is not um, um, a sporadic spur in, in, in a timeline. Um, unfortunately, it, it, it might come in, in various waves like we, we've seen already and it might also uh, change, mutate and, and come back in, in different other forms. So I think we need to be, like I said, uh, hope for the best, but uh, prepare for the worst and continue in that environment to, uh, to make it a better world and, and, and an easier world for everybody uh, around uh, uh, the globe. Thank you, uh, Frederick. Uh, Sanjis, you will tell us also which industry you're focused or also general, general no, answers? No, 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 I will, I, will, <laughs> I will give you a straight answer, Tony. I will, uh, <laughs> one area that we will uh, focus is, uh, is going to be gaming, Tony. So. Uh, Oh. The rationale is very simple here. I believe that uh, the gamers in the world, uh, the number of gamers are increasing, but I believe that be compared to before the pandemic and after the pandemic, 
there will be a big increase in the in the gamers, right? People who, I mean, you can only binge watch Netflix series to a certain point, right? And uh, with all the extra time we had in our hands, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we try to do different things in a lockdown. And I believe that this uh, period created a lot of uh, gamers that probably never uh, played a game in their lives before, right? So, uh, you know, I connected with my teenage uh, son uh, through a bunch of games, right? Uh, you can only, again, have a certain conversation with a teenager, maybe, you know, three minutes and you're done, but you could play two hours of games with him, right? And, uh, and I believe that uh, many people, like I said, who haven't uh, played any games in their lives, they started playing games. Uh, it could be a chess or it could be a, you know, poker or whatever it, it could be, right? Or uh, PUBG or anything. And they will, they will continue to do so. I think, uh, I think that's one area that will really continue to uh, grow uh, tremendously. And we will, uh, we will focus on this one because they keep scoring goals on me because of latency issues. Thank you, Sanjeev. In fact, who didn't uh, elaborate on this question? Because for me, I was expecting, and then maybe with the poll, we're expecting that someone will tell me health industry will be our next focus. Johnny? Go, go, go. Yes, please. Can you go ahead? Well, I, I, I would not say in health industry because you mentioned it now, and it was part <laughs> of it. But, but you, can still, you can still say it. No, but this health industry is definitely was on the uh, way, and it was well even before with 5G, too much of uh, this in the health industry. And as you know, we as a Salat is quite also engaged with the Ministry of Health, if you have heard whatever uh, recent uh, um, agreements and whatever that we have had. But what I will tell you, one area which maybe it came to my mind, what is this post pandemic has created is this working from home and the office rearrangement, I think there will be some industries to look into how all these industries better use their offices. This See, is bad news, this is bad news to real estate developer anyway. I'm telling you that this is an area where as we are talking, people, because at one, this pandemic, what it did? It, injected and everyone, whether it is your HR, your admin, your technical, your digital experts, maybe at one time, the digital people or experts who thought too much of digitalization were talking, but there was not much echo. Today, that echo is being heard everywhere. And now people appreciate what happened during the pandemic. And now that people with cloud-based, and as we said in the beginning, thanks to the cloud, with all these secured way of working remotely from anywhere, from using any devices, now you have to think twice, if not 10 times, what do you use, make best use of your offices? Everyone has a dedicated office, whether you still need those dedicated offices or you're going to change them. I think this is an area simple, straightforward, and I think there should be a lot of, uh, at least specialists, looking into this, how to transform. Apart from the normal digital transformation that, as I said, these things, we have been working on it. Nothing new. And that will continue, and that will be more. Pre-COVID, we have been working, and we know where we are. We use that readiness for what Actually, we were ready for COVID-19. Now, you will be definitely not going backward. You will adding more and more. But as I said, this COVID-19 brought a lot of things in your admin, in your delivery, in your everything. And your consumer, consumer and every this also have thought of different areas where you could partner with in terms of uh, more uh, adding to your uh, values, to your, uh, whatever you lose from somewhere else, new areas of creating business uh, that I think uh, COVID-19, post-COVID-19 definitely has taught us a lot and that will be the basis. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Emmanuel, we, I started this question with you, but you give me very, very uh, wide answer. Do you want to elaborate about the industries? Well, I think there's, there's, uh, there's one industry which has not been mentioned here, but uh, which played a, a critical role in, uh, in, the, in the COVID crisis is the, all the communication uh, uh, enabling applications. And, uh, and we see that, well, today the, the experience uh, with, uh, with this conference is, uh, is good, but, uh, but we experienced so many uh, meetings with, uh, with a bad, uh, with bad quality of um, a voice or video, or and, and I think there's there's a there's something to do on this and to uh, and to, to to improve the experience with uh, with these uh, tools which are becoming uh, a standard which were which was not uh, five months ago but which which are really uh, becoming a standard in both the, the personal communications but also the, uh, the 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 business communications. This is going to be a and then we have focus for us as well. Thank you. Uh, and now we'll go to our last questions. In some countries, mobile technical services cannot be fixed due to lockdown measures and therefore data, voice were disrupted. Did this offer an opportunity for satellite operator to, to fill the gap? Uh, I'll start with you, Elias. Uh, really, it's uh, the question start to you now. I'm sorry, Tony, I, uh, I had a bad connection here. Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, I said during, in some country, during this uh, crisis, and mobile technical service cannot be fixed due to lockdown measures. Therefore, yeah. data and uh, even some uh, voice uh, was disrupted. Is this often an opportunity for, uh, for satellite company or satellite operator? I mean, I mean by and large, uh, what we usually do is we have fully redundant networks wherever we, uh, whenever we install uh, any kind of site. So if there, if there is to, uh, to be a, um, a mishap, uh, we, we are redundant. Uh, and a lot of times what we can do is uh, we can do all the fixes remotely. Uh, we can change uh, frequencies or what have you uh, remotely. Uh, having said that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in some cases where we needed to go in and do a new installation, uh, we, we were challenged in some situations, but uh, where we needed to increase, upgrade, downgrade, uh, change some services, uh, we were able to do that remotely. No, sorry, I'm not talking about, about the opportunity created because if mobile operators, they have problem fixing their network for any problem, a satellite operator can fill the gap and take opportunity of expanding their business? Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. And that's what I was talking about uh, earlier, which is it's very important that uh, we realize satellite networks is an essential part of any telecom network. Um, and and uh, where we have the ability to switch back and forth between fiber, microwave, and satellites, uh, and, and we have a software-defined network that can at all times be looking at the cheapest, lowest uh, latency path, regardless of what happens. These, these are the networks that uh, have done a very good job in terms of resiliency. And uh, we've had similar situations uh, happen during the pandemic in Brazil, in Africa, in a couple of countries in Asia, where there were uh, partners of ours, mobile operators, that were using SD WAN, software defined WAN networks, uh, where uh, some return links were coming back in one method, fiber or satellite. The other one is uh, the forward link is sat satellite or fiber or microwave, whatever. And having the ability to switch back and forth uh, based on application by application basis, uh, not only gives you the lowest latency, lowest cost, uh, best uh, option, but it also gives you the resiliency in the event of a failure of any one path. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Mark, uh, my question to you. Frederick mentioned some cable marine cut during the uh, crisis last uh, three months. Do you, did you face any problem with your cable marine uh, for PCW? Uh, we were impacted a little bit in uh, West Africa, but we had uh, already quite a large amount of resilient structures in place between ACE and, uh, and the, our West African systems that took us 
inland and then back out on some terrestrials. We also had some facilities with, uh, uh, with Maine One and so on. So we weren't uh, aggressively impacted by those cuts. Uh, bear in mind that we're quite practiced from Asia Pacific where we have the bulk of our capacity in what's uh, lovingly referred to seismologically as the ring of fire around Taiwan, which is known as one of the most uh, challenging places in the world for subsea. Uh, we had large hits back in 2006, uh, Christmas 2006, 2008, and, and so on. And since then, we've taken a very uh, prudent approach uh, to assuring that all of our subsea is resilient wherever we lay it in. Um, I, I think that in some markets, and I guess that that's a leading question also with regard to satellite, we do have some satellite capacity still in Africa and in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we feed a, a reasonable amount of, uh, of uh, broadcasting television content uh, uplink from our facilities in Belgium and in uh, uh, Belgium, South Africa, and in, uh, and in Asia and Hong Kong primarily. And so we, we do understand that satellite business well, but we don't uh, necessarily see satellite as a replacement for fiber. I think instead in the subsea fiber place, we need to be looking at at good planning uh, for the traffic in order to make sure that we're covering as much as possible. Uh, we see satellite focused on specific applications. I want to remind you that satellites too can have outages and uh, whether it's at the earth stations or even in space and we've had to deal with those over time. And so uh, the idea is making sure that you're planning your network smartly regardless. And the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has made sure that we're planning even stronger uh, for any type of eventuality. Of course, uh, the ability to plan for a force majeure event is complex. Sometimes it's a stroke of, of luck and often uh, resolving it depends on the relationships among us on the panel here. Can I interact well with Cengiz, with Emmanuel, with Frederick, with Mr. Amiri and so on in order to make sure that the capacities that I have can also be made available to them and vice versa. And I think that what we need to recognize is that during a time of challenge as a result of something dramatic, it's important that we as service providers aggressively cooperate as opposed to compete. Because at the end of the day, it's our job as an industry to provide service to end users. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, we go back then now to the same question because you already mentioned uh, the cable in the 2006 in Asia more, which I guess this is, was a tsunami in Asia, a tsunami date. Oh, there was uh, earthquakes then. There were earthquakes. Earthquake also, okay, so tsunami was maybe earthquake, earlier also. There were, there yeah, were the, 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 the satellite at that time play a good role still in tsunami in many places, okay? The, the satellite play a good role to be fair. Uh, Vanit, uh, do you want to elaborate on this question also? Yeah, so uh, Tony, to add to your question, uh, even though we don't operate a mobile network, but uh, I agree with uh, Elias uh, that, you know, when mobile networks are designed, uh, the satellite is baked into the design as either a primary or as, as a backup, especially when they are serving remote locations. So, but definitely this would be an additional opportunity for the satellite operators uh, during these times. And uh, going back to the comment around um, uh, the cable outages on the submarine side, uh, we did, uh, you know, Touchwood didn't face any on our private network, but definitely there were some consortium outages where we had to, you know, uh, uh, do some uh, shiftings here and there. But at the same time, uh, the impact of COVID was that, you know, we, we did not have abundant uh, capacity is pre-built on our network, right? We, we had a buffer of 20, 30, whatever percentage on various routes. So when we had to build uh, 100 gigs of capacities, those equipments and the delays in installation definitely impacted the deliverables. The timelines uh, got a little extended than uh, usual. So th these were the main challenges which we faced uh, during uh, the pandemic. Thank you, thank you. Just before I, I, I also make the same question for uh, for uh, for Sanjeev, uh, the poll is open just for our participants. 
The poll is open already. Uh, we have already waiting question 10 and we have raising hand also. So with the question please, after we finish the answer. So this is last question, just to our participants. So just bear with me, we will answer your question just after we, we've done. Sanjeev, can you elaborate on this also? Sure. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I cannot make too many comments on the on the satellite business, Tony, that is, as this is not our uh, uh, core business at all. But regarding the submarine industry, submarine cables, uh, we were on the unfortunate uh, side of the business uh, in the fact that we did suffer a multiple number of cuts uh, during this period. And uh, we, again, uh, very hardly found out that uh, the repair processes took uh, three to four times longer than they used to take before the pandemic. Uh, this was all due to the uh, quarantine uh, situations. A repair sh ship, uh, for instance, if they needed to go uh, to, uh, to, to a repair location, they had to be quarantined by the, by the country uh, for a number of days. And then we had a number of uh, conflicts that we never thought we would see. Uh, as an example, some countries always uh, demand that uh, uh, their own people get on the repair ship, right? To observe, uh, observe the repairs, right? And uh, during the pandemic, uh, the repair companies did not allow anybody to get on board uh, the ship, for instance, right? And, and how do you resolve this problem? The country, home country demands uh, their people on board. The repair ship, company demands nobody gets on board because if anybody gets on board, then they would have to quarantine the ship for a number of days, 14 days and lose revenues. So we found ourselves uh, stuck between these uh, problems that, uh, that we thought never uh, would exist in our lifetimes, right? And, uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, what we learned is that uh, resiliency, redundancy is the name of the game, right? You have to really uh, build your networks in such a way that you should be able to especially on the submarine side of the business, that you should be able to afford uh, maybe double or triple cuts in your network and still be able to, uh, uh, to operate. So again, we put a lot of uh, emphasis on, uh, on building a resilient and redundant network uh, for uh, cases like this, but number of lessons uh, learned uh, from our end uh, uh, during this time. Tony, you're on mute, I think. Sorry. I was with everyone because there is noise. I received that there is noise in, uh, in the voice. Okay. Uh, Frederick, please, uh, you have mentioned the cable marine cat, you know. What was your alternative when you mentioned this alternative, uh, alternative of when your cable marine cat, you have this problem? Yeah, no, I mean, um, our, our network is, is extremely res resilient. Um, and, and even with double cuts on the same cable, which usually is, is, is for consortium or, or <clears throat> to restore that, it's almost mission impossible in certain cases. Uh, we, we had very little as no impact uh, into, into uh, our, our subscriber, um, let's say, uh, field compared to our competitors, uh, thank God. Uh, but um, the, the impact is actually quite severe because, I mean, if, if you look, for instance, uh, into Africa, where you've got four major arteries uh, kind of um, channeling all the traffic up to uh, mainly Europe and, and, and Asia and the rest of the world, if a few of them are cut at the same time, there, there is kind of a, a, a massive impact. So um, this is also why we we already have prior to these cuts extended our network dramatically and putting a lot more resiliency uh, into the, the rings which we've built it uh, onto the dry segments, uh, expanding fiber uh, into Africa, keeping uh, as much as possible local uh, in Africa, which, which is one of the strategies which really uh, bears its, its fruit. On top of that, I mean, we like, I mean, we, we, we've got a lot of mobile operations in, in our markets also. We, we do have also a, a fantastic backup system uh, through satellite uh, providers also, which, uh, which is, can be activated almost on demand, which is always helpful also uh, in, in, in various cases. Lastly, also, uh, we, we do see actually a trend where in, in 2025, even with the current capacity, 
uh, we do have around the continent in Africa, um, we, we will have a shortage of capacity. Uh, this is also why we, we decided uh, uh, to invest uh, into uh, new submarine uh, cables uh, together also uh, with Orange and a few other parties uh, where we're going to build a new cable on the East Coast but also on the West Coast, it's called to Africa, uh, which gives us a new way of actually activating uh, capacity which will be even more resilient because it's going to be deeper onto the seabed and not laying onto the seabed where we've got diverse paths also towards a uh, majority of the countries uh, in Africa uh, and that will give us uh, the needed additional oxygen also uh, to, uh, to say preempt uh, uh, again uh, catastrophic events uh, uh, fr from due to nature or, or any other uh, activities. Well, thank you. Thank you Frederick. Uh... Anyone would like to add anything before we start with the questions from the participant, from our audience? Okay, let me start with the first question then now. Should there be any negative impact if the status quo prolongs for next two years as more and people, more organization will try to digitize themselves and it's a lot can be pinnacle of the circumstances. So I guess, uh, it should be for Ali Amiri because it's, uh, he mentioned it's a lot. Uh, you can read the question, you can type uh, or answer live. What do you like to do, Ali? Answering live? Yes, I will reply because I'm not very much familiar with the Zoom uh, and uh, we are on team normally. Okay, then you can, you can answer live. Okay, no problem. I will manage it. Tell me again, what was your... Uh... Is this from the audience? From... Uh... Okay, tell me what was from the Amr, question. Amr Shah, he said... Uh, should there be any negative impact if the, if the statue of, of QO prolonged for next two years as more and more people and organization will try to digitize themselves and it's a lot can be pinnacle of the circumstances? Well, if I, I mean, if, uh, if, if I understand the question well, I mean, that uh, this negativity, if it stays for two years, this is what I understand? Yes. I mean, um, with something which uh, I, I doubted, but and anyway, as we said, uh, everyone is learning from, has learned a lot from this uh, pandemic. Uh, we've definitely been planning for digitalization, digital transformation long back. That is definitely going to continue. We know that there are some services which will be impacted as a result. More use of social media, whether it is on fixed or with, uh, mobile. But if every time we go on and off to lockdown, and which God forbid that will not be the case, then that's a different story because I remember as Mark said, there are a lot of areas where uh, it is a lot or uh, in terms of interactions because that change has to develop. And that's why people always hope for returning back to normal, more and normal. Yes, with new normal, but if that normalization does not come back, then the impact will be there for sure. Because uh, all the learnings from, it's not only it's a lot, it's the customers of it's a lot. It is the all these hospitality markets, all these uh, things, how can you, uh, because we have got partners, everybody is partner to each other. And if the business does not uh, grow, and there will be different way, ways of actually uh, making business, then at least uh, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more and more and we'll go accordingly. So uh, let's hope that it's not going to be for two years. Thank you, thank you. I will go to the next question if anyone will, uh, will take this question. If there is one thing you feel we as industry should have been in place to offer a better service to customers during COVID, despite the success of the industry, what would that would be that? Who will take this uh, to answer this question? I, I will take a slight um, variation to this, Tony. Okay, which please go ahead. 
which is one of the things that uh, we're seeing is um, a lot of less fortunate entities uh, that cannot afford to continue providing e-education type services to remote locations or e-health. Um, and I know uh, from our side, we have a give back program within SES where our employees have a lot of flexibility to provide services to uh, less fortunate uh, people that need to continue education and health services in remote areas. And I think as an industry, we, we need to keep that in mind and help uh, those that uh, need help uh, during this time. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to more questions now. Uh, okay, we said the question. With all, with regards to BCP strategies, how effective they are in the current time? And has been any significant changes? I can take that, Tony. So, uh, so BCP policies, I guess, uh, every organization has adopted. And even um, uh, they have been successful uh, for sure because uh, they, they are basically to safeguard uh, the employees as, as the first principle and also to ensure that there is business continuity for uh, the, uh, uh, the customers. So uh, in one week's time, we were operating like 98% work from home. Uh, and I'm sure this would be true for almost all the organizations here. And then slowly, uh, we, as we saw the uh, situation evolve, we changed it from two to six percent of attendance, six to ten today, and you know we are even heading towards uh, a thirty-three percent in certain selected geographies. So de definitely, to answer the point, uh, BCP strategies do help uh, in terms of keeping the employees safe, uh, ensuring that the businesses of our end consumers don't suffer. They continue in an un uninterrupted way, and uh, uh, this 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 probably is uh, going to help us in the long run as well. Thank you, uh, thank you, Vinit. Uh, okay, now we'll go to the other question. What are the, the lessons learned from this pandemic? And what will we change the traditional business model for data and voice services? I'll, I'll pick that up, uh, Tony, a little bit. I think, uh, yeah, I think that as always in a new environment, we're still involved in learning uh, what the lessons are. I, I think Elias, uh, highlighted clearly that uh, we learned that we could function no matter what from wherever. And that's helpful. That's helpful in understanding where we want to, how we want to make sure that business continuity is delivered even from home. It brings about also thoughts on how corporations should be looking after their employees when they work at home, which is a new story that we need to start to uh, cope with as uh, employing organizations. Uh, but in general, I'd say that we learned first and foremost that we can be resilient under many different challenges. Uh, we have to become better at it, more flexible, and I think that we have to aggressively pursue, and this is going back to my previous message around automation, I think we have to aggressively pursue uh, getting rid of any manual process that we have internal to our organizations and also interoperating with others so that we're able to function with greater efficiency when situations of challenges such as the one we're encountering can hit. Thank you, Mark. Uh, sorry, I forget to say the name. Last question from Wadia and Soplecom. Now we have Denise Bosco. Do we have the scoop of a new submarine cables hitting Middle East region? I guess Ali, you should ask, or maybe Sanji, is, is there any project of new uh, what, what, what I think the Middle East. What's the question? Any, any, any project, a new cable marine hitting the, quest, uh, the Middle East region? Any new submarine cables? Yes. I mean, uh, there are cables which, uh, what we call construction and maintenance design. One of them is Africa One, maybe, that uh, we are all part of. And there is uh, Two Africa, which is, uh, I believe, even signed, including maybe the supply agreement. So uh, there are a couple of, uh, these are the two that I can uh, see it now. Okay, I received comment to answer on this also, that peace cable is coming soon. So this to mention, the peace, P -E yes. That's Soon. Yes, oh, already, already an answer, alternative answer. 
Okay. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you. We'll go because we have a lot of questions, in fact. Let's go also to Jeff Seal now. Uh, we have talked about the need for automation for cloud access now. And the future, do you see data sovereignty by country becoming an even bigger issue and how will affect your business? I guess this is interesting. Uh, yeah, perhaps I can take it from you, there, Tony. So, um, no, it, it is certainly something which, which complexify quite a bit and also for the right reasons, uh, the environment. I mean, we see also a lot of more um, um, governors who would like to keep a um, uh, majority of the uh, sensitive information in country. Now, if you start cloudification uh, uh, on, on a wider base, it is certainly one of the key uh, parameters uh, which, which needs to be uh, addressed. Um, from, from, from our perspective, for instance, we, we try to keep as much as we can uh, within the African continent and, and, and try not to put it on, onto servers uh, all, all across the world where, where um, you, you might not comply completely uh, to certain parameters uh, of that. Uh, also from a, a quality perspective, from a routing perspective, from a way how you can operate in a more efficient way. I think that that's, um, that's quite uh, important uh, also. So it is certainly something which is, which is becoming more and more um, uh, important uh, w without, let's say, losing the, um, the benefit uh, of putting it into the cloud, you need to do it in a, a, in a cloud-wise uh, manner, and, and, and this is from an MTN perspective, we certainly uh, are striving to do. Thank you, thank you. We'll go to the uh, next question from Abraham Erki. Do you see necessity GSMA has to change standards, processes, or new technology due to COVID-19? How do you address this? I don't know who will answer on this, if GSMA will take new standards due to COVID-19. Anyone would like to answer this? I think that uh, I'm happy to pick, pick up a little bit, Tony. I think that uh, GSMA can certainly be an enabling factor as an interface between the industry and government. Uh, in one of your previous questions, uh, which was aimed around the satellite said you said that in some instances, it wasn't possible to repair mobile networks. Uh, it's necessary for all communication service providers at the government level to be considered as essential service providers, no different than government or military or, or health or whatever the case may be. And I think the GSMA can serve as a, as a very strong voice to assure that governments are giving that essential service provider component to the mobile industry. And if there is an area that they can help, it's in ensuring that that takes place. And in addition, they might also be considering new standards for automation. I, I know that uh, our team is working uh, together with them to try and consider areas of digital ledger uh, for settlement of, of services going forward. I think that's, that's another area. GSMA is doing some outstanding work and so anything that they can do to help facilitate the industry and its road to automation after COVID-19 is probably welcome. Maybe, Tony, I add also that one thing that GSMA, I think, seriously would look at it, and that's uh, at least we had one Barcelona conference canceled uh, this year. So uh, hoping that next year, so I'm sure a lot of people working on it, what will be an alternative to, to Barcelona, for example? That's quite a serious case, I think. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ali. In fact, I have another question from Ghali Eldwan. They say contribution, I would like to ask, what was and what will be expected contribution action of governments to telecom providers during the COVID-19 and post-pandemic as MOCs and regulators apply charges on telecom services in some gal countries in the Gulf? Who would like to comment from the Gulf? GCC. It's a long question. Can you repeat it? I don't, I, I, oh. I, I, <laughs> yes, exactly. It's long. Uh, it's about regulator, which I usually avoid. I would like to ask what was and will be expected contribution action of governments to telecom providers during the COVID-19 and post-pandemic as MOCs and regulators apply 
charges on telecom service in some country, MOC, I guess, Ministries of Communication in some country or regulator, apply charge on telecom service. Well, I mean, think the question may be a little bit not very clear, so I don't want to, unless uh, someone... We, we can skip if no one will answer, no problem. Yeah, but uh, uh, Tony, I, I can't answer uh, on the behalf of Gulf, but yes, we have not seen any uh, Indian operator uh, giving any concessions to mobile operators, rather they are seeing it, uh, you know, the mobile or, or uh, the telecom providers as, you know, uh, uh, as, as profit-making organizations even today. So I, I, we have not seen any concessions from the government coming, uh, at least in India. We have one question for you uh, now. Okay, okay. I, I word the uh, concession that was missing in the answer, I think, for me. Uh, I, 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 it's the same, I think, I can, in the Gulf, uh, what, what uh, we read and so far aware of is that there were no such cases. Thank you. Anyway, uh, Question from uh, George Robert to Vanit. Tata Communication obtained ISP license in KSA. Can you explain the objective of this license? Okay, yes, so, Vanit, this, so this, is, uh, this is basically not uh, uh, from a wholesale standpoint, George, and uh, uh, all the distinguished members. So this is basically to serve uh, the enterprises and uh, we are looking at Saudi Arabia as one of our uh, growth markets in addition to UAE of course and some selected markets in Africa. So uh, the, the regime is, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of liberalization which we have seen in Saudi Arabia. There are a lot of MNCs coming, establishing their uh, nodes and their base in, in Saudi Arabia. We see this as a growth potential for us, especially in the enterprise space. So earlier, our right to play was only on the B-end side or you know, we do the service provider stuff through our landing partners or through our consortium partners. So this new license or an upgrade of our existing license, I would say, will, will give us a bigger right to play when we, if we have to serve the enterprises in a KSA. Uh, thank you, Vanit. Uh... Now we have a question for, uh, for Emmanuel from Christine Ziedi. You have mentioned, Emmanuel, the need to adapt to the new needs and demands of customers. How is Orange adapting to that change? Well, uh, I think we have a, a major challenge here because we, are, we uh, are in a period where we need to, uh, to be uh, even more listening to our customers before we can um, with the with the, the those, those few crises, what uh, what the what are what the, the voice uh, is uh, disturbing your voice. Is it okay? I was saying that we we are in a period where we need to uh, to listen to our customers uh, even more than before and understand what uh, the learnings are from the this COVID period and uh, what the expectations are. And at the same time, we are far away from them with uh, difficult uh, difficulties to uh, to meet them. So that's uh, that's I would say the, the the first challenge we have is really to uh, to find a way to uh, to better listen to our customers and uh, anticipate what uh, what their needs are in this period of, uh, of recovery uh, and in the in the post COVID period where we need to get prepared to uh, well to maybe facing new uh, period of crisis. And see what they need. What they need is uh, is uh, is uh, security. What they need uh, is uh, simplicity. Uh, so different customers have uh, have lived this period with a, a different perspective and have different expectations towards us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, sorry, we still have one minute only for the questions. Uh, I will go to Aziza Aziz Al Ali. Are the investment in new sub submarine cables project going to continue? or carriers will prefer upgrading the capacity of the existing cables to meet the increasing demand of bandwidth till the recovery of COVID-19 and stability of economy situation. Interesting. Let's go for you, Sanjay. Uh, Tony, yes. <laughs> uh, look, uh, if you look at the submarine cable maps today, right, I mean, it's, you could see that there are certain parts of the world that are underserved. Uh, certain countries, certain regions. So I believe that the investments will continue, but probably not in a 
in a me too type of fashion, but in certain select uh, unique uh, routes that connect the uh, underserved uh, regions uh, with each other. And obviously, you know, there are some initiatives taken like the Silk Route and uh, that will uh, uh, see a major corridor, for instance, uh, from China to, to Africa that will create uh, certain investments uh, that will complement to, uh, to this traffic data flow. So uh, for sure, I mean, the upgradability of certain cable systems are uh, to a certain extent are limited, right? And, uh, and they will certainly continue uh, as, the, as the technology on that uh, front uh, improves. But uh, I believe that we will uh, see more and more, not the traditional, but more unique routes uh, uh, being invested into. Thank you, Zach. Uh, we will, I know time for a question is, uh, is done, is over. Do you mind if we take one more question? Because we still have 12 uh, pending questions. So. It's very interactive session. I'm happy. How is 5G is going to all the world? What is the ex ex next plan to defeat the challenges? I guess this is out of uh, of topics. Out of syllabus. Yeah. In fact, uh, we did the 5G last month. I hope you did. Okay, Ahmad Diwan from Korek. The question is addressed to Elias. Korek, uh, I don't know. Elias is operating in uh, in Iraq. Okay, Elias, a mobile operator, we are less dependent on satellite provider and then fiber and microwave since this is a challenge. When it comes to quality and affordability, what are the initiatives you are working on now to enhance the customer experience and make the satellite more affordable and feasible to compete with fiber? I guess it's very important, Elias. So, so we've seen uh, quite a change in what satellites can do for satellite uh, cellular mobile backhaul over the last uh, five to ten years. We went from wide beam, you know, three, four, five thousand dollars a megahertz equivalent, whatever that translates to in terms of megabits, to very high throughput satellites. And right now, over the Middle East, over Iraq, for example, we do have a high throughput satellite, SCS 12, which was uh, put into operation recently, about a year ago and we have a lot of capacity on it. And with high throughput satellites, we have more concentrated uh, throughput capabilities in smaller areas. And that allows us to provide a much better service with smaller dishes and uh, at a lower price. Uh, and that we, we're not stopping there. Uh, we, we're going from high throughput satellites, HDS, to very high throughput satellites, very uh, VHDS. And we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're investing in Empower now, billions of dollars going into that program to provide a lower latency, high throughput, lots of dynamic allocation at uh, better pricing. So uh, that, that's kind of like what we're doing. But I want to go back to uh, this and the other question that I saw about SD-WAN. I think it's really important to build satellites because we complement fiber, we complement terrestrial. It's really important to build it into the final solution. And, and I want to give a shout out to Orange here, where we partnered with Orange in multiple countries in Africa. And what Orange has done is they have designed a solution that is dependent at the same time on fiber, microwave, and satellite. It is not either or. It's not like if the fiber goes down, I'm going to switch to satellite. Uh, you have IP transit applications, you have cellular backhaul applications, you have uh, voice applications. Uh, uh, all of those are running at any one time on all three paths, uh, depending again on the best path method. So you don't have to wait until something goes down to, to switch and then suffer a failure. At any one time, different applications are going on different path so that if one path were to go down, the other path immediately picks up and satellite should be part of that path, uh, part of that design. Thank you, Elias. Uh, really, um, I'm sorry. We have still 11 questions. So I, we, can, we don't have time. So to all our... Uh, uh, audience who want to ask questions, please send us to by, by email. We'll try to get you the answer from, the, from the, our speaker. Because now we will have one more answer before we go. 
final call for the poll. We already we have 81% uh, vote. So we can still have one more question and one more vote. Uh, until to see about every questions. We have many questions if you want to take one of them. So can you check uh, the questions or uh, we skip them, just we skip them. How to plan to respond differently for pandemics? If anyone would like to answer. Just general question. How to what, Tony? How to? How to plan and respond differently to the pandemics? Well, I, I just may I may just say that uh, at least uh, with pandemic, uh, the planning it does not uh, in an organization. We are number one. You are taking the safety of your staff, uh, the organization as a whole, of course, and at the same time, how to interact with your customer, even the premises. Accessing the premises uh, is uh, by itself now becoming a, a technique where you have to plan and do the work accordingly. So uh, in every area, uh, there is a learning curve, whether it is from your admin side or from technology side. We talked a lot about the plans and digitalization and all that. But I think uh, overall, how to plan and live with this environment it's more about a lot of it also to do with logistic. Uh, mind you, for example, during this time, we had one area locked down, one area clo uh, closed. So how to move, how to, all these uh, logistics, I think has to be taken care of. Uh, so I, I believe the question is uh, more in that area rather than the other areas that we answer that. Thank you very much. Anyway, in fact, we answered already. Uh, do anyone would like to comment on this? Uh, any answer from different angle for this uh, question? Otherwise, we just uh, take picture now for the screenshot for our coverage. So be ready, okay? Because our team is taking pictures. Uh, I would like to thank you all before I launch the poll. Okay, you will be with us. Thank you. Really, is, I'm very happy to have you all. It's a very interactive panel. We still have even 13 questions and two raise, three raise hand uh, would not answer. I guess this will encourage me to see you again soon. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will launch the poll now. Uh, I hope my team already take the picture for us. Uh, very useful, okay. So now I will end the polling and share results so i will go first question was was your mobile data interrupted during covid 19 lockdown 11 percent yes they said yes and 75 percent they said no and 14 percent they say not all time uh, did you make more voice calls than usual during lockdown 73 percent they said yes and 27, they said no. So this is, I guess, which proves the statistic from the user's point of view. You used internet more for uh, work, especially video conferencing, 72%. Video streaming, Netflix, Apple TV, etc., 21%. Social media, 7%. This is show us really the behavior of the people during this uh, pandemic. Are you still using your fixed broadband network at home for work? 81% they said yes, 8% they said no, and 11 partially. Okay, so this is our figures for today. So I guess we stop sharing the result. And just I would like to say thank you again uh, and hope we'll be in touch soon. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Tony. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.